What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Just wanted to remind you guys to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you end up enjoying this video. If you guys like these daily uploads, please be sure to do all that as it supports the channel and allows me to continue making these daily uploads for as long as possible. If you guys have any thoughts about the stories within this video, please be sure to leave them in the comments below, as my favorite part of making these videos is hearing what you guys think about the stories therein. With all that said, I will let you guys enjoy the next 40 minutes or so of true scary stories, and I hope you guys have a great day. I'll see you again at the end of the video. As much as I love this time of year, I'm always reminded of one of the worst memories of my entire life. I've always been an outdoorsy type of person. Any chance I had to be outside, I took it. Whether it was hiking, sports, being at the beach, you name it. If it was outdoors, I was there. Now, back in high school, which at this point was around 10 years ago, my parents signed me up for this trip with the school. They were doing this camping and hiking program. We were going to take a weekend trip out to the mountains. I loved the idea for a bunch of different reasons, mainly because we were getting out of class on Friday. I was able to talk a bunch of my friends into going as well. I was so excited to spend the weekend in nature with my buddies and just sort of not care about the world. Friday came and we hiked a decent chunk of this local mountain. It wasn't that bad. Honestly, I think the trail was designed for beginners. At around 5.30, we decided to set up camp. There were probably 15 students and three teachers on this little expedition of ours. The first night, my friends and I, who were all sharing a tent, got in trouble with one of the teachers. There was a strict lights out policy by 10 p.m., and we were still very awake and active at that time. One reason I was able to convince my friends to go with me was not just the no school on Friday thing, but because we could play our Nintendo DSs in the tent. Pokemon X and Y versions had just come out, and we were all playing together. If you can't guess, we were very loud and excited while playing the game. The teacher made us turn them off. We were all kind of upset, but listened to them anyway. I didn't sleep well that night. I could hear all kinds of noises outside the tent. It could have been an animal, but I thought it was also maybe a teacher checking up on us throughout the night to make sure we were actually in bed. The next morning, I was pretty exhausted. Once we started hiking, though, I got into a real groove, and I felt pretty good again. During the day, one of my friends suggested we sneak out of the tents at night. I didn't love the idea myself. I hated breaking the rules. I just wanted to play my new game with my friends. Nightfall came once again, and we told everyone we were hitting the sleeping bags early. It was around midnight, and I was nearly asleep when my friends woke me up to sneak away. I was groggy for a little while, but the thrill and excitement woke me up eventually. I did realize how stupid it was to sneak out into the middle of the woods at night, but I didn't think about it like that. My logic was, we weren't doing anything bad or illegal, so the repercussion surely wouldn't be too severe. We moved a good distance away from the camp, so we wouldn't wake anybody up. Most of us had nearly full charge on our DSs, so we said we'd play until the first DS died. Then we'd head back. The first 30 minutes were pretty great. I felt like I was making an awesome memory that I would cherish forever. Unfortunately, I was about to make a memory I would remember forever, but for all the wrong reasons. After that first 30 minutes, we began to hear a rustling in the trees. We all froze. My first thought was that it may be a bear. I was terrified. I didn't know what I would do. A few seconds later, though, a person emerged from the tree line. It was just as jarring, and even more unexpected. Honestly, it was really weird. The man didn't look at us, and he didn't say anything. 
we were all sitting on some tree branches in almost a semicircle. The strange man sat in the center. He looked to be maybe in his 40s. He was average build with mostly dark hair, clean shaven, and most notably wearing some pretty nice looking clothes. A strange outfit for a man in the middle of the woods. None of us said anything. We all just kind of looked at each other, not sure what to do. The man just sat there, essentially looking down at the ground. We all looked at each other and silently agreed to get up and make our way back to the campsite. We silently counted to three and stood up as one. As we stood up, the man stood up as well. He stood completely still and did not look up either. The man didn't seem to be hostile. It was almost as if he was just mirroring our movements. That was the final straw for us, though. We freaked out. We decided to run as fast as we could back to the campsite. I started, and everyone followed. I looked back and could see the man was lightly jogging after us. It was one of the worst things I'd ever seen with my own eyes. This emotionless man in the middle of the woods, chasing after us with barely an effort, but still keeping up all the same. The lack of emotion in his face was so disturbing. It looked like he wasn't even breaking a sweat keeping right on our tail. Thank God we were eventually able to lose him. At least, we thought we did. We zipped our tents up quietly, and all agreed not to tell anybody. I don't know why, really. We were stupid when we were kids, and we were scared we would get in trouble. We stayed awake the entire night, jumping at every little tree branch snapping or gust of the wind. We had never been so happy to see the light of the morning. We hiked out of the woods that afternoon and never saw the man again. Since we were now safe, we figured we would still never tell the teachers about what happened. We didn't get caught for sneaking out and didn't get hurt by that weirdo in the woods either. I still wanted to tell someone, but my friends all talked me out of it. Basically, they convinced me that if I got in trouble, all of us would get in trouble. They thought it was best to sweep it under the rug. I guess I'm lucky nothing worse happened. We absolutely should have told the teachers. At that age, though, the idea of getting in trouble seemed like the worst thing. Now that I'm older, though, not a single fall season goes by where I don't think about that strange man in the woods. Years ago, I moved into an older apartment. It was pretty cheap, and the building only had eight units in it. There were four on the ground floor and four up above. All of them opened up to the outside. It was really all that I could afford, or else there's no way I would have moved in there. The rent was about $400 a month, and in that location, it was really cheap. The apartment that I had was on the ground level, at the far end. It had one bedroom, one bathroom, a living room, and a kitchen. After moving in, I had no problems filling in the space with the furniture I had. I didn't even have that much stuff either. For the first two or three days, things were perfectly fine. I was gone for most of the day at work anyway, and back by nightfall. One night, though, I went to bed at around 10 p.m., only to be woken up in the middle of the night. Somebody was knocking on my front door. I looked over at the clock and saw it was nearly midnight. I sat up and turned on the light in my bedroom. Why would anybody be knocking on my door at this time? I got out of bed and walked out into the living room. I turned on the light in there too. I could sort of see there was indeed someone at the door. I could only make out their silhouette though. When the light turned on, they immediately turned around and walked away. Needless to say, I did not get a good look at them at all. I went over to the door and tried to look at it, but they were already gone. I couldn't find any sign of them anywhere. It was really weird, but I decided to just go back to bed. I was able to get back to sleep fairly quickly. I'm not aware of the person coming back that night, as I didn't wake up for the rest of the night. The next day was pretty normal. I got up, went to work, 
came back that night and fell asleep at the usual time of 10 p.m. Once more, though, for the second night in a row, I was woken up in the middle of the night. This time, though, I wasn't as sure what had woken me up. I didn't hear anybody knocking on the front door or anything. In fact, it was eerily silent. I turned over to go back to sleep, but suddenly I wasn't tired at all. I was wide awake, and I was feeling terrified for some reason. I sat up and turned on my bedroom light. Everything seemed to be in perfect order. I decided to get up and go to the bathroom, then try to fall back asleep. I got up from my bed and walked over to my bedroom door. The door was closed, so I opened it to my living room and kitchen area. The living room was closest to me, and the kitchen was at the other end. The only light was coming from my bedroom, so it was hard to see anything. I didn't see anything out of place, but that feeling of terror was still sitting with me. When I stepped out, I heard a strange noise, seeming to come from the kitchen area. It was in a section that was not immediately visible to me. I stopped where I was and tried to peek over the counter. Now my heart started beating really fast. I had no idea what was going on. I called out, Is anybody there? It was dead silent. I didn't hear any noise at all. I had no idea what to do in this situation. It sure sounded like somebody was in there, but I was still not 100% convinced. My eyes were just locked on the area I had heard the noise coming from. Seconds later, somebody suddenly appeared. They stood up from behind the counter and started running toward my front door. It was only 15 feet away from them. Since it was so dark, I couldn't make them out very well, but I was absolutely sure this person was my landlord. He made it to the door and threw it open, then sprinted out of my apartment. I couldn't believe what was happening. I ran over to the door and slammed it shut, then locked it. I went into my bedroom and called the police. I told them my landlord had broken into my apartment in the middle of the night without my permission. They came out and talked to me and said they were going to talk to the landlord. I couldn't really do anything else. All I could do was go back to bed. The next day, I got more information. The landlord admitted to being in my apartment. He was also apparently involved in other illegal activities. As a result, all of the tenants of his building had to move out, and the building was transferred to new ownership. I'm not sure about all the details. All I know is I really had to scramble to find a new place. Really for the best, though. I would much rather live in an apartment without the sort of landlord that chooses to break in in the middle of the night. Growing up, I never went to summer camp, mainly because my parents couldn't afford it. I remember asking one year if I could go, but it got shut down quickly. My parents could barely make ends meet. I was able to attend sports camp in the summer, though. It was similar to your typical summer camp, except mainly focused on a specific sport. In my case, it was basketball. It was just for one week out of the summer. You would do drills, play games, eat, make friends, and just have a good time, really. After graduating, my life took a turn in a direction I never expected. I started coaching basketball at the high school level and teaching the fundamentals of the game to grade school children. After a successful first year as a coach, I reached out to the community to see if a basketball summer camp would be something they were interested in. I was overwhelmed by the support I got for the idea, so before the end of the school year, I found a gym to rent out and decided to host a basketball camp for kids, 4th grade through 10th grade. It would be first come, first serve, and when all the spots were filled, that would be the end. The camp was Monday through Saturday, it would be a sleepover camp as well. To my absolute joy, every spot was filled within just a couple of days. I couldn't wait to get started in this venture of mine. When we were packing up our stuff on the last day of sign-ups, 
a very angry man entered the gym and began screaming. Hey, where do you think you're going? I'm signing up my boy right now, so you better wait right there. I was immediately annoyed by this guy's tone. I tried to be as calm as possible. I'm sorry, sir, but every spot's been filled. I apologize. I wish I could take every kid, too. Well, this guy was not having that. He started making a scene, kicking over chairs and throwing things around. I tried to get the man to calm down so I could explain to him why I could only take a certain amount of children. He just would not stop his freakout scene. I felt bad for his kid, honestly. Thankfully, the kid wasn't there with him, so he didn't have to witness all that. I understand what it's like to want to give your kids something, and sometimes the world does say no, but you have to deal with that. He finally left, after giving a genuine supervillain speech about how I hadn't seen the last of him, and I'd be sorry now. As a coach, I'd been threatened by parents a million times before, and I never took it that seriously. Most of the time, they just want what's best for their kids, and they'll say stupid stuff in anger. I treated this incident no differently. Finally, camp time arrived. I ran the camp a lot like the basketball camp I went to when I was a kid. Drills, scrimmages, downtime, even some fun mini-games for character building and team camaraderie. My staff of coaches and I really worked the kids hard on the first day. That first night, almost every camper was asleep by eight or nine, which was great for us. We didn't have to try and wrangle in and calm dozens of teenagers down. This pattern of hard work and early nights continued for a couple of days. By Wednesday, I only had one kid that wanted to go home. After a nice conversation, we convinced him to try and stick it out just one more day and stay that night. At around 11 p.m., I was making my rounds to make sure all the kids were in bed, not being a distraction for everyone else trying to get to sleep. The location of the camp was in an old school that wasn't used for classes anymore. It was somewhat updated and pretty nice, though. And to paint the picture a little better for you, the campers slept in various classrooms. Before you scratch your head and say, how's that work? Before the camp started, we went in and converted the classrooms into some livable spaces. They were almost like cabins you would see in an outdoor summer camp, just inside an old school instead. After my walk, I was able to confirm that most of the kids were asleep or at least in their beds talking to each other quietly. On the other side of the sleeping quarters was the gym. To get to the gym, you had to walk down a long hallway then cut down through the cafeteria which also held the stage. While I was walking through there, I could hear a sound coming from on the stage. I shouted up asking whoever was up there to come down. I figured it was one of the kids or a coach or something. I didn't know why they would be up there, but I still wanted them to come down. I shouted again and got no response. Clearly someone was up there though because I could hear a noise that was blatantly footsteps. It was unmistakable. I shouted one last time. All right, I gave you a chance. I'm coming up there now. I jumped up on the stage and was shining my flashlight all around. I didn't see anybody. I couldn't hear anything either. Just as I was about to walk away, from behind one of the curtains, I heard an angry voice call out to me. I told you you'd be sorry. I shined the light in the dark pockets of the curtain, and from that black void, I saw someone charge right at me. I could immediately tell it was that angry parent from the sign-ups. Before I could even react, he'd tackled me on the stage and started throwing punches into me. One of the other coaches heard the commotion and came running in. He ripped the guy off me. The guy was just going crazy, flailing all over the stage. I had no choice but to punch him in the face. Once we subdued him, I called the police. Thank God they came quick. They escorted the man out of the building. But believe it or not, this is where the story actually gets crazy. The man's kid was already signed up to the camp anyway. He was separated from the kid's mother and didn't have custody of him. 
Apparently, the man was not mentally stable, which was pretty obvious now. The police informed me that his wife had told him several times the kid was already signed up. I guess he was upset he didn't get to do it himself, claiming it was a father's job or something like that. A very messy situation. I had to spend most of the day contacting parents and letting them know what happened and that their children were all safe. That was the only incident that ever occurred like that, and I'm thankful it didn't ruin the camp for all the kids. It certainly was a scary moment, though. Every year before I host that camp, I think about that guy. I have no idea how he even got in. All the doors were locked and there were no windows for him to climb in through. The only thing I can think of is that he arrived on the first day and had been hiding inside the school the entire time we were there. Just the thought of that gives me the chills. It just makes me think, even when you think you're safe, you never know who might really be watching you. My sister had an experience as a child that I think I should share with you. I was also there when it happened, but it's my sister who's been affected the most negatively by it. It wasn't as though we could have seen it coming. Our hometown is small. No more than 20,000 even today. It was probably less back then. We grew up in a very religious house where the Bible was read every evening and church was attended twice a week. Despite no longer being a part of the church, I enjoyed those days. Everyone was kind and seemed to love it. It was like having a giant family. Looking back, our home life was a pretty normal Midwestern one. My sister and I never went without anything, and neither of us ever felt unloved or lacked support when we needed it. I'd go so far as to say we had perfect parents, or at least as perfect as any could be. We still have a very close relationship, and I don't hesitate to go to them whenever I need help with my own kids. As great as our folks were, though, they couldn't watch over us 24 hours a day. They had to work, and we had to go to school. Since first grade, my sister and I had gone to a Christian private school in our city. Like most regular schools, we had a recess period. Ours happened after lunch. It was during one of those times when some stranger decided to make his appearance. I was 12 that year, and Martina was 9. Since the school was small, all the grades took their recesses at the same time. Just like any other big sister, I've always been very protective of Martina even when she was off playing with her friends. I made sure to check on her every once in a while. On this day, I was talking to another girl my age, when she suddenly brought something to my attention. I looked over and saw Martina talking to a man by the fence's side. I didn't recognize that man at all. I started to get kind of nervous. This was in the 90s, mind you. All of us kids were getting that stranger danger talk drilled into our heads constantly. Unfortunately, Martina had always been friendly to anyone who was nice to her. In a perfect world, her innocence would have been very sweet, but the world we live in is far from perfect. I ran over to our teacher and told her what was going on. We ran towards the fence. The man fled as soon as he saw us approaching. Martina was crying when we reached her. The poor girl didn't understand why we'd driven her friend away. I tried to explain it to her, but she was just too naive and kind-hearted to understand. I stuck to her like glue after that. She and I would eat lunch together, and I would stand near her during recess. She didn't like it one bit, of course, but I didn't care about that. For a while, her safety was all I could think about. I became obsessed. I had nightmares of her being grabbed by a stranger. It was far too much pressure for someone so young to take on, but the fear of losing my sister drove me mad. My parents were naturally concerned as well. They did all they could to try and explain the dangers to her, but stopped when she looked like she was about to cry. Now that I'm a parent myself, 
I understand why there's a fine line between teaching your kids an important lesson and destroying their innocence. Even at 12, I knew the danger strangers posed, despite not yet understanding what sick things they might actually have planned for me. Until that incident, we had always walked to and from school, but had to ride the bus after that. This made the school day so much longer, and I quickly grew to hate it. School took the danger seriously, and hired a second safety officer to patrol the campus. All the necessary measures seemed to work. Several months passed by, and it was looking like the man had moved on to somewhere else. Eventually, the alert level was lowered back down to normal, and everyone got back to their regular lives. Even the second officer was let go. We all thought we'd be able to return to our own lives. From all appearances, the creepy man was nowhere to be found. That wasn't the case, though. He had taken a real liking to Martina, and he knew all he had to do was be patient and wait till we let our guard down. When that day came, he would strike, and come it did. About nine months later, it wasn't where we expected either. It had been almost a year since the incident at school. Most of us had returned to our old habits, and I began letting Martina out of my sight during recess again. The one remaining safety officer was spending most of his time smoking in his car, and the teachers were all distracted. It was safe to say no one was prepared for what was to come next. It was a Saturday afternoon, the first truly nice and warm weekend of the year. We were at the park with our mom and some friends. I had been pushing her on the swing just a few minutes prior and stopped to get a drink from a water fountain. I guess she was all alone in that moment. The man came and snatched her. I was alerted by her sudden screaming and turned around to see that very same stranger running away with her in his arms. I immediately took off after the man, screaming for my mother. She and a few of the other mothers in the park began chasing after him as well. It looked like the man was going to get away. Just a few yards away from his car, though, he stopped and put her down. He had this sour look on his face and was patting his shirt. I remember seeing he was about to pick her back up, but noticed we were too close. He hesitated for a moment before turning and running for his car again. Amazingly, he left Martina there. He jumped in his car and sped away, but not before my mom and a few others got his plate number. When we finally reached my sister, we saw why he had put her down. She was so terrified she had peed herself. I can't imagine the fear she must have felt. My mom scooped her up and held her suffocatingly close. We all cried. It was equal parts relief and heartbreak. The effects of the trauma showed up almost immediately. When the police tried to question her, she wouldn't answer. She remained that way for several months. The once vibrant and talkative little girl was almost catatonic. No matter who tried to speak with her, she would never answer. She had a distant, empty gaze that stayed on her face. My mom became inconsolable, and I didn't know what to do. The only bright spot was that we had the man's plate number. While we waited for updates, my mom did all she could to get Martina to talk again. She saw a long series of counselors and psychiatrists, but not much was achieved. She would eventually speak again, but there was no going back to that blind trust she once had. Most of her life was spent alone in her room from then on, the only place she felt completely safe. She rarely dated anyone as she grew up, and if she did, it was only guys she had known for most of her life. Against all odds, she did eventually find somebody, but their relationship is constantly being tested by these issues. The stranger actually got caught eventually. Our dad volunteered to deal with the investigation from there on. All I know is that he did go to prison, but I'm not sure for how long or where he is now. Should he be stupid enough to show his face in this town again, it will not end well for him. This happened during my sophomore year in high school. 
I remember I took an elective class that was called Outdoor Activities. It was an easy and quite fun gym class where we went outside and did many things. We had a different subject every week, and they all revolved around the outdoors. One week, we learned how to fish. In another, we would play tennis. For this week in particular, we were going hiking. I remember we hiked on a path near the school grounds earlier in the week. Then, later in the week, we took a field trip to a state park that was nearby. The park was pretty large, with many different trails on it. Our teacher, Mr. Soleri, was leading the way for the rest of us. The class was not that big and had between 15 to 20 people in it. On the day of the field trip, we all boarded the school bus and took a 20-minute ride there. The class period was going to go longer than usual, and we would be able to skip the first part of our next class. That's something I wasn't exactly mad about, as my next class was math. After we got to the park, we all got off. I saw what the place looked like. There was a lake, there was a spot for picnics and stuff, there was a bunch of paths and a huge wooded area. Mr. Soleri started down one of the paths into the woods. He walked pretty fast and made it clear that we were there to hike and not to mess around. We all started following him. I was walking with one of my good friends named Marcus. He also happened to be in the same class. Marcus and I were walking at the very end of the line. We were admittedly moving at a much slower pace than everyone else. I remember I think we were talking about girls or something, getting really immersed in the conversation. There was this one girl I really liked that he was friends with, and he was giving me some advice. We were so engrossed that we were not really paying attention to the rest of the class very well. The path we were on was surrounded by woods and had a lot of twists and turns. Because of this, it didn't take long for us to not even be able to see the other people in front of us. We didn't really care, though. We knew we could catch back up at any time. As we continued our conversation, though, I remember at some point we suddenly heard a noise off to our left. It was the sound of twigs breaking and leaves moving around. Something was moving off in those woods. We both assumed it was an animal at first, but it would have to have been a large one. I remember Marcus saying, Did you hear that? We guessed maybe it was a deer or something. We paused our conversation and started to look a bit closer. We couldn't really see anything that far in the woods, though. It was really dense. I saw some branches and leaves moving, but I couldn't tell what was causing it. We were curious, though, so we decided to take a couple steps into the woods. I remember I sort of made my own path by stepping through the dense brush. After a few steps into the woods, I could see a little bit better. We kept walking closer to the noises and made it within ten feet. That was when I saw movement up ahead. I realized there was a man there. It was not an animal after all. But what was this guy doing out here in the middle of the woods? He was wearing a very dark brown jacket. I could see he had a messy beard and very long hair. He snapped his head to look at us. That's when we decided to go back to the path. Neither of us said anything. We just started making our way back in that direction. I was a little bit creeped out, seeing this guy standing in the middle of these dense woods. After we made it back, we continued to walk in the direction our class had gone. By now, though, they were way ahead of us. We were not walking for that long before we heard more movement out in the woods. This time, it was much closer, though. It seemed as though the man in the woods was now making his way to the path we were on. We tried to ignore it and keep walking. We continued our conversation, but then the man emerged onto the path. He was just following right behind us, going the same way we were going. He was about 40 to 50 feet behind us. This was very unnerving. Marcus and I decided to move faster. We wanted to catch up with the rest of the group now. After a couple minutes of walking at a fast pace, I could still hear the man following us. I looked back. 
He was walking faster behind us, keeping pace with how we were going. He was around the same distance behind. We were so far behind the class, though, that we still couldn't even hear the rest of them. At that point, we came to an area where the path went three ways, left, right, and straight ahead. We had no idea where everybody else had gone, so we chose the path to the left. After walking down that way, we realized the man had still followed us down the split path. At that point, Marcus and I started running. We both played sports and were athletic guys, so we would be able to run for a while. We were sure there was no way this guy following us from the woods was going to run too. We were wrong. He started to jog after us. Now, there was no question that he was chasing us. Marcus and I went faster, desperately trying to get away from this guy. The more we ran, though, the more we realized we must have gone the wrong way. We would have certainly caught up to the group by now if they had gone this direction, but we couldn't go back or else we would run right into the man's arms. We just kept running and decided to go off the path. There was an area where the woods weren't as thick. Marcus and I both cut off the path and entered the woods and continued to run, sprinting through the forest. We got scratched up and hit by various tree branches. The man followed us off path and entered the woods again. After we ran for what felt like a long time, we saw another path. We ran to that one and started jogging down that as well. The man was still behind us. We jogged on that path for about a minute before leaving and going into the woods again. We really had no plan. We were just winging it. After running through the woods for a while longer, by some miracle, we made it to an opening with another picnic area. There were tables, another parking lot, and a lot of people around. We were so glad to see them. We emerged from the woods and ran toward them. They had strange looks on their faces, seeing us come running out of the woods from out of nowhere. When we looked back, the man had not followed us. He was still in the woods. We walked through the picnic area. There was another path on the other side that sort of went by. Marcus and I didn't really know where to go, so we just walked along that path. We headed down it for a while. About a minute in, we heard voices of people up ahead. And then we saw Mr. Soleri and the rest of the class. They looked surprised to see us. We were extremely happy to see them. Mr. Soleri asked us where on earth we had come from. We told him the whole story. He wasn't mad at us or anything. In fact, he found it quite funny and was giving us a hard time about it. I was just really glad we were able to get away from the guy. I'm not sure who he was or what he wanted from us. Maybe he was mad we disturbed him while he was wandering in the woods. I don't really know. I just think it's so crazy he ran after us for so long. That was certainly my most memorable field trip. This happened to my mom about a year ago while she was visiting me. I woke up to get a drink around 4 a.m. one night. My mom works third shift, so she was still awake and I decided to hang out with her. She told me she had just gotten back from the 24-7. When my mom was on the way back from the store around 3.30 a.m., she saw what looked like a person crawling on the road. She rolled her window down to ask if the person needed help. As she got closer, though, she could hear the woman screeching absolute bloody murder. My mom described her as looking like her jaw was about to unhinge itself. My mom wasn't easily fooled, but she wasn't just going to flat out ignore this situation either. She remained in her locked vehicle and yelled out the window to see if the woman needed the cops or something. The girl just started going on and on about how someone was after her and wanted to kill her. As the girl was rambling, my mom saw a car pull up from the other direction. My mom yelled at her to get out of the road. As the girl noticed the car, she got up like it was no problem. The car passed by, and then a man seemingly appeared from out of nowhere. He began yelling at the girl, saying a bunch of random stuff and trying to get her to go with him. 
the girl seemed to be afraid of him. Just as he noticed my mom, he was already at my mom's window practically instantly. He charged over in a split second. The ordeal was just way too strange, so my mom sped out of there. Once my mom was a bit further down the road, she called the police. They told her they'd already received one or two calls about this already that night, and they didn't act concerned at all. As my mom told this story, it really made my skin crawl. This all happened only a ten-minute walk away from my house. I never encountered anything like that in the three years I've lived here, and nothing even close has happened since either. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you liked the video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any feedback for me as well, be sure to leave that in comments below the video. If you guys have a story you'd like to send in, or if you'd like to contact me for any reasons, there will be links to my social media in the description below the video including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get to you as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what type of story it is if it has one, and how you'd like to be credited in the description below the video. Please make sure to include as much detail as you feel comfortable with and try to use as much proper grammar as possible to make sure you have the highest chance of appearing in a future video. Overall, I think that's pretty much it for now, guys, so thank you so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.